Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Sussex Vision Series. And today we are delighted to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Wei Wei from the uh, University of Chicago. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome oh, to Sussex Vision Series. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you? Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Professor um, Wei Wei. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Professor Wei Wei uh, uh, is actually an associate professor with Turner in the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Chicago. And in terms of uh, in terms of um, academic background, uh, she did her postdoctoral research at the University of California in Berkeley with Professor Marla Feller. And, and her PhD uh, was carried out uh, at the Watson School of Biological Science at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York uh, under the supervision of Professor Roberto Malino. So um, during this stage, she uh, studied uh, many aspects of synaptic plasticity. And nowadays, she will be presenting a inter really interesting talk, which is titled Context Dependent Motion Processing in the Retina. So Wei Wei, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. And it is a pleasure for us to host you today. Thank you so much, Jose, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my slides. You can share now your screen if you want. Yeah. Does it work? Is it working? Uh, OK, one second. Uh, OK, I'll share again. Uh, you, you have to share. No, yes, it's okay. perfect. OK. It's working? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you again. Um, so, um, so a general goal of my, uh, of my group is to understand the neural basis of sensory processing. And an influential conceptual framework for analyzing neural circuits is David Marr's three levels of analysis. So the first level is um, computation. So what does the circuit compute? What's the function of the circuit? And next is the algorithm. So what is the algorithm used for carrying out such a computation? And then lastly, how is the algorithm implemented by biophysical substrates in the nervous system, such as synapses, dendrites, and uh, neural networks? And in this framework, uh, in the visual system, a prominent computation is the direction selectivity. And direction selectivity uh, is, uh, was first discovered by human weasel in the cat primary visual cortex. And they find that some cells in the visual cortex have a directionally tuned to moving stimulus. So they fire most strongly when the stimulus is moving in one direction, but uh, minimally, minimally when the stimulus moves in the opposite direction. And a few years later, direction selectivity um, is uh, uh, was characterized by Barlon Levick in the very early stage of visual processing uh, in, in the rabbit retina. So with many years of uh, studies, uh, we, know, we now know that in, uh, in, um, in the retina, there are uh, uh, many two uh, groups of direction selective ganglion cell types, the on and on off types, that are also tuned to the direction uh, of uh, image motion. And there's also very exciting uh, discoveries recently uh, in a primate retina by uh, Dennis Daisy's group and Nay's group at the University of Washington, showing that these uh, direction selective cells are also present uh, in, in the primates. But in this talk, I will focus on the on-off type of direction selective ganglion cells. And so in this slide, this is a uh, uh, on off DSGC in a mouse retina. So here is the uh, top view of, of the dendrites, and this is the side view. So these cells have two layers of dendrites, one uh, in the on sublamina and the other in the off sublamina of the inner plexform layer, IPL. 
And here is the example tuning curve plotting the number of spikes as a function of motion direction. So the arrow in the middle is the vector sum pointing to the preferred direction, and the opposite direction is the null direction. And there are four subtypes of, of on-off DS ganglion cells in the retina, and they, their preferred directions align the two cardinal axes, vertical and horizontal axes. So these cells uh, project to major uh, visual pathways centrally. So the, they, their axons leave uh, the retina and project to the, uh, the shell of the dorsal LGN, where, and then um, from LGN, the information is further uh, conveyed to the visual cortex. And there are many studies looking at how the information from uh, those on-off DS ganglion cells are used by the downstream pathways. And so another major target of those cells are the superior clicklets. So here, the relationship between uh, the retina and the clicklets is a bit simpler. So uh, in a collaborative study with JC Khan's group, um, uh, exploring this uh, relationship, so JC's group found that the retinal inputs to the direction selective clicker neurons uh, direction, so, so the direction selective clicker neurons receive tuned <coughs> retinal inputs. And uh, when we use a, a conditional knockout mouse line where the retinal direction selectivity is selectively disrupted, JC's group found that the direction selectivity in the clicklets uh, is impaired, indicating that the direction selectivity in the clicklets uh, is inherited from the, from the retina. So these cells uh, has been a, a, um, a classical model to study direction selectivity and the under, underlying neural mechanisms. So there are many uh, multiple mechanisms that that all contribute to the direction selectivity of those cells. Uh, and, but the key, one of the key mechanism is the null direction inhibition. So in this slide, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I will just briefly introduce this, uh, this, uh, the mechanism of the null direction inhibition. So here is an uh, 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 example uh, spiking activity from uh, on-off DS ganglion cells when the bar is moving uh, in the preferred direction, you, we see a lot of spiking, but in the opposite direction, the cell uh, doesn't fire. And then when we measure the inhibitory current of the cell, we see that the inhibitory impulse to the cell is directionally tuned. In the null direction, um, uh, inhibition is strong and fast uh, so that it can veto excitation and suppress spiking. But in the preferred direction, the inhibition is weak and delayed to allow uh, max uh, firing. And the source of this inhibitory current comes from uh, the amacrine cell called Stabber's amacrine cells. So these cells form GABAergic synapses to the direction selective ganglion cells. And both Stabber cell and ganglion cells receive light evoked glutamatergic input from this vertical photoreceptor to bipolar cell pathway. When a bar is moving in the null direction of the ganglion cell, the stabber cell release maximum amount of GABA onto the ganglion cell. And this is underlies this null direction inhibition. So to summarize this in a simplified way within this uh, Mars uh, uh, three levels uh, uh, framework. So the computation of this circuit is, is to compute the direction of visual motion and it uses an algorithm of null direction inhibition. And this null direction inhibition is implemented by the direction selective GABA release at the synapses between the Stabber's amacrine cells and the ganglion cells. But in this talk, I will uh, move away a little bit from this implementation of direction selectivity. But, uh, but rather, I'd like to uh, showcase a few recent examples from our lab showing that there are many context dependent phenomena occurring at all three levels of the circuitry at the computation level, at the algorithm level, and at the implementation level. So th there are three scenarios that we particularly looked into. One is when the, the background of the visual motion is noisy. So in this case, 
uh, this such as um, in, in this example the duck is moving through this glistening water and the, and the second scenario is um, when the motion trajectory is interrupted by occluders uh, in the scene, what happens to the ganglion cell response and what are the underlying mechanisms that mediate those response? And then this, uh, the third mechanism, uh, the third scenario is how the ganglion cell response is affected by, uh, by prior visual experience. And these are done by three uh, brilliant uh, former grad students in the lab. So the first one, uh, the noise project is done by Chris Chen, who is now a postdoc at uh, UW in Fred Ricky's lab. And then the, the second project uh, was done by Jennifer Ding, who is now a postdoc at Harvard with Chris Harvey. And then <clears throat> the, the final project was uh, led by uh, Lindsay, uh, who is now a postdoc at Young Dance Lab at Berkeley. And so I will, just briefly summarize the, uh, the conclusions of the first two and, and focus on the last story, which is just published uh, 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 last week at, Jour at Journal of Neuroscience. Okay, so first, uh, this is a summary slide for the noise uh, study. So we found that in the retina for this direction selective circuit that is dedicated to compute motion direction, there is a, a uh, a neural mechanism that that mediates the noise resilience of this motion detection. So when the background have noise, um, the direction selectivity can be preserved over a wide range of noise levels. And this noise resilience um, is implemented by a circuit motif. It's a disinhibitory motif consists of serial inhibition among stubborn amacrine cells before the stubborn cell inhibiting inhibits the ganglion cell. And in collaboration with uh, Rob Smith uh, at UPenn, uh, we figure out that the, the, uh, this disinhibitory motif mediates noise resilience using an uh, algorithm that is not disinhibition. So instead of disinhibition, this motif preserve, preserves motion evoked inhibition. And this surprise, this, you know, the, this is initially quite surprising to us, but we found that the visual noise in the background will engage in a, a specific uh, network dynamics and, and that interacts with synaptic plasticity mechanism between the starburst and ganglion cells. So basically the interaction between network dynamics and synaptic plasticity can invert the algorithm of this canonical disinhibitory motif so that instead of disinhibition, it can mediate, uh, it can preserve inhibition instead. And in the second um, uh, project, Jen looked at how on off DS ganglion cells respond to uh, moving stimulus if, if the motion trajectory is interrupted by occluders. For example, uh, instead of this just continuous moving bars or drifting gratings, if the moving stimulus is occluded by stationary uh, objects or uh, a moving object emerged from occluder, uh, uh, we, uh, so first of all, this project uh, was in collaboration with uh, my theory colleague, Stephanie Palmer and her former undergrad, Albert Chen, uh, who uh, helped us with the theoret theoretical analysis and also uh, with David Burson, who helped us with uh, connectomic analysis on the underlying uh, circuitry. So the take home message is that when uh, the moving stimulus is moving in a continuous uh, a trajectory along a, a continuous trajectory. We have this uh, uh, canonical uh, computation of the direction of the moving objects, and this is implemented by the null direction by the Stabber's DS uh, inhibition. Um, and so this is the the normal DS mechanisms. But when uh, the stimulus is moving, uh, uh, when the trajectory is interrupted, then uh, the population of on off DS ganglion cells transiently switch from encoding the direction of motion into encoding the spatial location of the motion interruption. And this is uh, suggested by the theoretical analysis by Stephanie's group. 
And this is implemented by uh, a neural mechanism that involves a spatial displacement of the excitatory receptive field of those ganglion cells. And because during interrupted motion, um, because of this spatial displacement of receptive field, at the site of the motion uh, interruption, the op so the two DS ganglion cell populations that are tuned to the opposite motion directions uh, have a transient synchrony because the, the, the ganglion cells that are normally uh, tuned to the opposite direction of the motion can fire null direction response at the site of motion interruption. So there is a synchronous firing between oppositely tuned ganglion cell populations, but only at the, at the site of motion interruption. And this local synchrony is very beneficial, it's very salient, it's very detectable, and uh, is really help, uh, helpful for encoding or pinpointing the precise location in, uh, during the motion interruption. So one, one way to think about this is that the population response of the ganglion cells that tunes to uh, uh, the two directions of the motion axes will normally encode the direction of the moving object but at the site of motion interruption, this population response will transiently switching from encoding direction to encoding location, which could be beneficial for the animal's uh, survival. So the, for the rest of the, my talk, I'd like to focus on, um, on the recent project we, we, uh, which look at how the on of the S ganglion cells response is influenced by prior visual experience. And this is again in collaboration with Robert Smith at UPenn and led by a former grad student, Lindsay, in the lab. So the question we, uh, we ask is how, how is DS ganglion cell response influenced by, um, by prior visual stimulation? And the, the initial um, reason we want to look at this question is by the anecdote anecdotal observation in the lab. So when we started recording from, when we start recording from a retina, we always have a set protocol. So we'll first test the light responsiveness of the retina by showing a spot, like a flashing spot to make sure the retina is light responsive, the tissue is healthy. And then we show, we start to do a tuning curve from the DS ganglion cells by showing moving bars, for example. And then after the tuning curve, we usually show the flashing spot again to check whether you know, the cell is still there, is whether the tissue is still light responsive. But, uh, but you know, everyone in the lab has, has the impression that when we first show the flashing uh, spot, the, the ganglion cell responds moderately. But after the tuning curve with moving stimulus, then if we show the flashing spot again, we all think the flash response become more robust and stronger. But this is all anecdotal, everyone sees that. But when Lindsay joined the lab, she decided to study this phenomenon more systematically. So she designed an induction protocol to induce this type of sensitization. So, so what she did is she showed a test spot. This is a very weak spot to elicit a moderate response in the ganglion cells and the test box is delivered every four seconds uh, with one second uh, on time. And after a period of testing spots, we have this baseline firing rate to the flashing response. And then we, uh, so she showed an induction stimulus. This could be drifting, bar, drifting gratings or contrast reversing gratings or moving spots. And both all these, uh, uh, induction stimuli can induce sensitization. Uh, so after this induction stimulus, she, she used the test bots again to test the sensitivity of the ganglion cells to, to light flashes. So here is an example response from a dorsal DS ganglion cells. So here upper panel is the firing rate, the lower panel is the spiking, uh, raw spiking trace. The, the black is the before the induction stimulus, the red is after the induction stimulus. <clears throat> so you can see that before the induction stimulus, we have this baseline on and off response from this ganglion cells. But after this 20 seconds of uh, induction stimulus, both the on and off response is stronger. And we also see the appearance of a sustained firing. We call, we call that sustained component after the induction. 
But if we check this in the ventral ganglion cells, we only see the sensitization of the off response, but we didn't see the appearance of the sustained components. And we also didn't see a sensitization of the on response. And just to, uh, here's a schematic, the ventral cells, uh, their receptive fields are, 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 are in the upper visual field and the dorsal uh, cells have uh, receptive fields in the lower visual field. And we quantified this sensitization with an index, which is the normalized difference between the response after the sensitization and before the sensitization. So for index of zero, so there's no sensitization, there's, there's no change in, in the sensitivity. For index uh, more than zero, uh, there is sensitization. For index less than zero uh, is adaptation. So here's the summary. <clears throat> so for the off response, we can see both doors on the ventral cells show sensi sensitized off response. And, but for the on response, we only see sensitization in the dorsal cells, but not in the ventral cells. And also only in the dorsal cells, we see a, a, the appearance of a sustained component following sensitization. And just to summarize again, so in dorsal ganglion, DS ganglion cells, both on and off responses are sensitized and there is a sustained component. And, but in ventral cells, only off responses are sensitized and there's no sustained component. And here uh, is just example showing that this phenomenon is transient and reversible. So here we, we did the testing spot first, and then we did uh, induction stimulus, and then we test again to, to, and, and to see the sensitized response. And then we stopped the protocol for a while, and then the cell will quickly go back to the baseline uh, firing rate. And then we can induce sensitization again in the second trial, and then wait a bit, and then the cells firing rate go back to baseline, and then we can induce it again and again. And we also look at the timing of this phenomenon. And so here we use the testing spot with increasing intervals after induction to see what's the maximum interval that we can still see the sensitized response. So we see that without uh, uh, continuous testing, the sensitized response after induction stimulus will return to the baseline in, in five to 15 seconds. But interestingly, after the induction stimulus, if we keep showing the testing spot at, uh, for example, the, the five second intervals, then the, sensitize, the sensitization will remain as long as a testing spot is always delivered. Uh, so, um, so next, with, uh, uh, Lindsay looked into the synaptic mechanisms underlying the sensitization. So she wanted to know whether the increased uh, sensitivity after the induction stimulus is due to enhanced excitation or due to decreased inhibition. So for this, she looked at the, both the uh, subthreshold uh, membrane depolarizations by looking at the PSPs. This is after the spiking is dig was digi digitally removed from the trace. So we can, you can see that compared to the before induction traces, the red trace, which is after induction, for the dorsal cells, she see sustained depolarization in the baseline, and then also uh, more depolarized response for the on and off uh, 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 response. But for the ventral uh, cells, she only see sustained uh, sensitized uh, uh, off response for the PSPs. And then she also uh, uh, recorded EPSCs, which is the glutamatergic input from on and off bipolar cells. And she found that after sensitization, the dorsal cells have a sustained depolarized, uh, sustained uh, increase in the glutamatergic EPSCs and also in enhanced on off transient response. But for the ventral EPSCs, she didn't see the sustained component consistent with the lack of sustained spiking. And she, she saw on, um, the sensitized um, uh, light evoked response. So here's the quantification. Again, showing only dorsal cells have a sustained component, um, uh, but, but, which, but it's not, uh, which is not uh, present in the ventral cells. So, so 
it seems that this sensitized response in the ganglion cells is due to enhanced excitation from the bipolar cell excitation. <clears throat> and then next, she tested whether uh, the sensitized response in the ganglion cells uh, requires synaptic input, or can she just simply depolarize the ganglion cells by electrical current injection to, uh, to mimic uh, the sensitization. So what she did is she first recorded DS ganglion cell activity during uh, this induction stimulus. So this is current clamp recordings showing that the membrane potential response to the testing spot. And then during the induction stimulus, this is drifting gratings for 20 seconds. And then the following by followed by the testing spot. And then she clipped the recorded waveform during the induction stimulus. And then she used this waveform in the voltage clamp experiment to directly patch onto a ganglion cell and, uh, and, um, and activate the ganglion cell according to the, uh, to the activation, activation pattern of the cell during the induction stimulus. So we just voltage clamp the cell to mimic the activity of the ganglion cell during induction stimulus. And then for the rest of the time window, during the testing spot period, she hold the cell at minus 60 millivolts to record the EPSCs. So, so she can still measure the level of sensitization of the EPSC before and after this uh, direct uh, depolarization of the ganglion cell. And so in this case, synaptic currents uh, are blocked where there's no visual stimulation. So the ganglion cell is only activated by direct uh, electrical uh, uh, stimulation. But in this case, she didn't see any sensitization of the EPSCs or the ganglion cell response, indicating that synaptic inputs is required for this phenomenon. So another uh, question is, about the sustained component that appears in the dorsal uh, DS ganglion cells after induction. So she next asks whether the sustained component originate from on or off pathways of the bipolar cells. So what she did is she blocked the on pathway with AP4, and then she do the induction protocol again. So first of all, in the presence of AP4, the on response is blocked as expected but she still sees sensitized response in the, uh, the off response is still sensitized and she still see the appearance of a sustained component indicating that the sensitization of the off response as well as the sustained component originate from the off bipolar cell pathway. And she also recorded the PSPs in AP4, again, consist consistent with the spiking activity. She see that Although the on response is abolished, she still see sustained uh, component and uh, uh, after the uh, and also sustained uh, uh, on response uh, in AP4. And similarly, the EPSC data is consistent with the off pathway or origin of this sustained component and the uh, and off response. And and then she. Uh, uh, look at what what are the signaling uh, mechanisms that that mediates this uh, this sensitization. So she tried various uh, pharmacological uh, agents to block different type of signaling. So she we didn't find uh, effect with uh, gabazine. The gabergic signaling is not involved. Uh, uh, the um, uh, muscarinic and nicotinic receptor signaling doesn't seem to be required for the sensitization. And the only drug that had an impact in the sensitization is the strychnine. So in the presence of strychnine, both the on and off spiking response is no longer sensitized. And we also see a significant reduction in the sustained component. And uh, similarly, a similar effect is seen for the EPSCs. So strychnine blocks the uh, sensitization of the off and the sustained EPSCs as well. So to summarize uh, uh, these results uh, I presented so far, we think that glycinergic signaling is required for the sensitization of the dorsal uh, DS ganglion cells. We think before the induction stimulus, there is a 
glycinergic amacrine cell that modulates the uh, glutamatergic inputs from the off bipolar cells to the on-off DS ganglion cells. And after the induction stimulus, um, the, the hypothesis is, is that this glycinergic inhibition adapts uh, after the induction stimulus, and this leads to the disinhibited release of glutamate from the off bipolar cells so that the off, uh, off DS ganglion cells receive more glutamate from the off bipolar cells. And there's one thing that we also noted is that in the presence of strychnine, so if we block glycinergic signaling, uh, we, the strychnine didn't prevent the sensitization of the on EPSCs, the glutamatergic uh, uh, response, but it does abolish the spiking response, the on spiking response. So this suggests that the sensitized uh, on EPSC is not sufficient to cause the, the, the sensitized spiking response for the on pathway. So this is just uh, the recapitulation. So the strychnine doesn't affect on EPSC, but abolish the sensitization of the on spiking. And we also noted that the strychnine impairs the sustained component. And we know that the sustained component originated is originated from the off pathway. So our hypothesis is that the sustained component from the off pathway plays a role in the, sensit in the sensitization of the on response. So the hypothesis is that after induction stimulus, the off bipolar cell release more glutamate, both transiently to the off response, but also have a tonic increase to cause the sustained depolarization. And this, and of course the off bipolar cells have this sustained depolariz depolarization in the off dendritic layer, but we hypothesize that this sustained depolarization from the off dendritic layer can spread to the on dendritic layer to boost this, the excitability of the on dendrites so that the next incoming on EPSC is more, is more likely to generate a spiking response. So, so there's basically the electrotonic spread of depolarization from the off dendritic layer to the on dendritic layer. And, and, and so and one way we think about the bi-stratified on, on DS dendrites is that there are two dendritic layers. And so the spread can occur you know, from one layer to the next layer through the soma. But another interest and this, but another feature of the on off DS uh, dendrites morphology came to our attention because we noticed uh, there are many crossover dendrites between uh, the on and off dendritic layers. So here is an example uh, of a reconstruction uh, of a DA, on off DS ganglion cells recorded. Uh, and you can see that the off and on dendritic layers uh, are shown, um, but also many, there are many dendrites that uh, are cross between the layers. And this phenomenon has been observed uh, very early on in the rabbit and in the mouse. And, um, but here um, we start to wonder whether those crossover dendrites actually plays a role in facilitating the electrotonic spread of, of depolarization from off to the on layers. <clears throat> so uh, uh, a former undergrad uh, in the lab start to analyze the, this morphological feature of dendritic crossovers. So in this example, this is the same cell, and this is the off dendritic layer, this is the on dendritic layer, and the red uh, colored dendrites are off layer dendrites, but originates from on layer. So these are coming from a diving dendrites from the on layer and then further elaborate in the off. And then in the on layer, those yellow colored dendrites originates from the off layer. And so again, this is the uh, side view. And then here is the quantification. So there are different configurations. There are um, layer uh, dendrites in the off layer that come from on a layer. In, and there are uh, on dendrites that come from off layer. And then there are some from on to off and then back to on and, and the other way uh, around. But the most uh, common crossover configuration is off 
dendrites originate from the on, from the on layer. And this is quite, and this crossover is very consistent across all cells in the DRD4, in the posterior tuned uh, cells we reconstructed. And about 30% of total dendrites originates from the opposite layer. And also, we also did a show analysis to analyze where are the diving points uh, distributed uh, uh, concentrically. And we found that most of the crossover points occurs in the in the distal half of the dendritic tree. Um, and, and, and this seems to uh, facilitate the spread, uh, the, the signal propagation across the dendritic layers and bypassing the soma. And then our collaborator Rob uh, uh, used a biophysically realistic model of the cell. And so she, he used the same cell that, uh, that I showed in the previous slide and, uh, and, and uh, simulated the electrotonic spread when we uh, inject current or a synaptic impulse occurred in off layer and how effective it spread into the on layer with the crossover dendrite. So here's a simulation. And so the on layer is shown uh, in, the, in the off layer is in the top, on layer in the bottom. And then uh, the current injection is in here in, the, in, in, in this mark in the off layer. And then you can see that because of the crossover dendrite, the on layer that are vertically aligned to the injection site in the off uh, have a prominent uh, uh, increase in, in uh, membrane potential depolarization too. And Rob also simulated uh, with, uh, uh, with known uh, active dendritic mechanisms uh, in the model. And he found that this uh, crossover events is local. And this, so this is because the depolarization in the off layer um, is more effective in recruiting the on uh, layer uh, active mechanisms when the electrotonic distance between the on-off layers are shortest. So, is, so this effect depends on distance. So the model predicts that if, uh, if a sensitization is locally induced in one side of the dendrite in the off layer, then the on response is, is, more, is more effectively potentiated in the on layer that are vertically aligned. So meaning that the, uh, on the same side, on the same side of the of the dendrites, but if the induction or if the if the sensitization is induced in the opposite side of the dendrite between the on and off layers, then the off and so this this is less effective in boosting the on response in the on layer. So so again, this simulation is is mimicking the the induction protocol we use. So in this case. A uh, local test spot is used, and then a local induction stimulus is, um, is used to induce sensitization in one side of the DS ganglion cell dendrites, followed by an on, uh, on uh, stimulus, either in the same side, side or in the opposite side of the dendritic tree. And so the model predicts that when the uh, testing spot for the on and off at the end on the same site, we should see a more pronounced sensitization of the on response due to the, uh, uh, the crossover signal from the off dendritic layer. Uh, so we tested uh, this simulation results with experiments. So what Lindsay did is she showed a local testing spot followed by an induction stimulus, a local drifting gratings, but spatially confined to one side of the DS ganglion cell dendrites. And then she after induction stimulus, she tests the spot response using a test spot either in the same side of the induction stimulus or in the opposite side of the induction stimulus. Then she found that she see more pronounced sensitization of the on response if the testing spot is on the same side of the induction stimulus compared to the spot that was delivered to the opposite uh, of the induction stimulus. So this is consistent with the modeling showing that this crossover, uh, uh, so the, the, the spread of the sustained depolarization from the off dendrite 
is, is distance dependent. So it's more effective in recruiting active dendritic mechanisms and to bring the on dendrites above the spiking threshold uh, at the shorter electrotonic distance. So to summarize, uh, we found that um, in, the, uh, in the dorsal retina, we see that after a short period of induction stimulus, the off response of the ganglion cell is transiently enhanced. And in the dorsal retina, we also see the appearance of a sustained depolarization originating from the off layer. And this sustained depolarization in the off dendrites of the ganglion cell spread into the on layer of the dendrites. And then uh, this, uh, and through the both the soma and the crossover dendrites. And this leads to the increased excitability of the on dendritic layer and which underlies the enhanced on response. And in the ventral retina, we didn't see uh, sustained depolarization. We also didn't see sensitization of the on response. Again, suggesting that the sensitized on response in the dorsal cells uh, comes from the sustained depolarization from the off dendritic layer. And, and since this mechanism originates from the off bipolar cell pathway, we wondered whether this, is, this, can, this, uh, this mechanism also impact other retinal ganglion cell, cell types. So Lindsay uh, recorded, uh, targeted several other cell types, uh, mostly the alpha uh, cells with big soma size. So she uh, recorded a subset of uh, trends in on alphas, sustained on alphas, trends in off and sustained off. And she only found the similar pattern of sensitization in the sustained off alpha cells. So again, in the dorsal, in the, in the dorsal retina, she found that at least a subset of sustained uh, off alpha cells also shows sensitization after the same induction protocol but in the ventral sustained alpha cells, she didn't see sensitization and she doesn't see the sustained uh, firing. And also she looked into development. So when is this sensitization first appear in development? Uh, so she found that around eye opening or right before eye opening about P12 and P13, she didn't see sensitization in the dorsal cells. So if anything, she, she see a, a, a moderate uh, adaptation. And it seems that this sensitization in, in, uh, uh, is developed after eye opening. And then she checked whether uh, she can prevent the development of this phenomenon with dark rearing. So when she dark reared animals from P8 all the way to P13, she still see sensitized response from those ganglion cells. So indicating that the sensitization of the ganglion cell is developed after eye opening, but is independent of uh, dark rearing. So dark rearing doesn't uh, affect uh, the development. So here are just a quantification. So uh, early in, right around eye opening, uh, we didn't see any sensitization. If anything, there might be a, a tendency to adapt for the on response. And, but uh, we see a sensitized response in the adult, even in the conditions of dark rearing. So to summarize uh, uh, this part, we think, so we, are, we particularly look at a phenomenon where the on-off DS ganglion cells show adaptive changes in gain to prior visual stimulation. And this, com this computation is implemented by glycinergic signaling in off bipolar cell pathway, but we only see that uh, in, in a dorsal retina. And then uh, this uh, glycinergic uh, mechanism implement uh, short-term disinhibition of bipolar cell excitation, and that underlies this uh, adaptive change. So our phenomenon add to the increasing findings of sensitization in, in the retina and across species. So previously, uh, there are multiple studies looking at contrast, uh, sorry, not contrast, uh, both contrast adaptation and sensitization. For example, uh, Steve Bacchus group have shown that 
uh, if you show high contrast, a period of high contrast stimuli and followed by low contrast, a subset of ganglion cells in the salamander, mouse, and rabbit uh, ganglion, uh, uh, ganglion cells show uh, adapting response after the high contrast. And also, uh, Leon Lignado's group showed in that in the zebrafish, there are subpopulations of retinal neurons that show sensitizing response uh, after high contrast. And recently, uh, Manuking's group have shown that in the unmeasured ganglion cells, when uh, presented with a, a, a low a temporal frequency gratings, also show sensitized response. And so, uh, you know, these. Uh, Together, so in, in our protocol, we didn't use, uh, so the induction stimulus is with the same contrast, but uh, we had, I think the temporal kinetics is different between the testing spot and the induction stimulus. But regardless of the, the specific induction protocols for sensitization, I think all our studies points to a common theme of sensitization mechanism, which is the adaptation of inhibitory inputs to the bipolar cells. So it's a disinhibition of the excitation that underlies those sensitization phenomena. And so to just to summarize, uh, so with, so, these recent examples using a bit more complex uh, visual stimuli uh, really highlights the context, contextual modulation of, uh, of visual circuitry, even at the very early stage in the retina. So depending on the visual context uh, or depending on the visual stimulus, the commutation of the, uh, of the retinal neurons can be flexible. It can, uh, there's flexibility in what type of information the ganglion cell can encode. And there's also flexible algorithms. So you know, that, for example, the, the same circuit motif can function very with different uh, algorithm, algorithms depending on the visual stimulus. And also different visual stimuli will recruit different subset of neuronal substrates to implement those context-dependent uh, uh, processing. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab. Uh, so the three projects uh, have, uh, are done by uh, Chris, Jen, and, and Lindsay in the lab. And uh, also uh, a former student, Hector, uh, has done really um, interesting, very nice work in, at the dendritic level, but I, I didn't have time to talk about today. And, and the rest of the lab. And I'd like to also thank uh, my wonderful collaborators. Rob has been collaborating with us uh, on multiple projects on, on the modeling. And Stephanie and uh, Albert Chen has been helping us with theoretical analysis and, and look at the, the coding of, of the uh, ganglion cell response. And David has been helping us to uh, uh, mining the connectomic data to support to uh, to uh, to provide insight into the implementation of those um, uh, of those computations and also I'd like to thank my founding source thanks okay um thanks a lot a uh, really really interesting talk um um okay thanks a bunch of data really interested uh, findings and yes, so uh, we can uh, proceed with the questions that are coming from, from the chat. So um, Anna, Anna Blessed is, is saying and asking, uh, these are very interesting results. I'm curious about the intensities and colors of the, of the visual stimuli you are using. Are you using a UV wavelength stimulus in the ventral retina? That's the first question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so initially, when we look at the dorsal ventral difference, we see that the ventral cells doesn't sensitize for, for the sustained component and for the off response. And uh, of course, the, the dorsal and ventral retina, one prominent difference is, the, is the, their absence, right? So the ventral cells have a ver very high density of s absence but the dorsal cells have much lower uh, as opsin content. And so our OLED, we use organic OLED uh, uh, LED that, so our visual stimulus uh, cannot activate as opsins. Uh, 
So that so to and so we then did a more experiment to see whether the lack of sensitization in the ventral cells is due to our stimulus, right? If we cannot activate as option effectively, maybe we, we couldn't. Uh, it's not the right stimulus to activate uh, to sensitize the dorsal cells. So then we used the UV LED to perform uh, the same induction protocol in the ventral retina. So the UV LED is more effective in activating the S options in the ventral retina, but we still couldn't induce sensitization uh, using a UV LED. So, so I think, so there's definitely, um, you know, the dorsal and ventral retina already uh, uh, taking inputs differently because of the photoreceptor difference. But it seems that even when we sufficiently activate S options, we still cannot induce the same sustained depolarization and the on response in the ventral retina. So our hypothesis is that something in the IPL, in the off bipolar cell um, uh, 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 circuitry in the inner plexform layer is responsible for the dorsal ventral difference. So they might be differentially modulated by glycinergic signaling, for example. Okay. So I have another question from Tomomi Ichinose, mm -hmm. um, which uh, says, I missed the reason why the sensitization happens only in the dorsal retina. Is the glycinergic cells differentially expressed between the two sides? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So whether, uh, yeah, because uh, Ishino's lab has has a very elegant study on the on the um, cholinergic signaling at the bipolar cells, we 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 don't know for sure. We only tried DH beta E, uh, which is a uh, a nicotinic blocker that block alpha uh, alpha two three I think doesn't block alpha seven very well nicotinic uh, nicotinic receptors so DH beta E cannot prevent sensitization so it's not those nicotinic receptors we also use atropine which is the muscarinic receptors and they also failed to prevent sensitization so it's not muscarinic but we don't know whether it's alpha seven or it's other yeah cholinergic. Uh, signaling could be involved. Okay, so yes, moving forward, yes, uh, I we at the moment we don't have more questions from the chat. And um, remember, if you are interested in discussing more in details, uh, I already posted the the Zoom link, so we can go to a private room. Um, I was yeah, I I also had. The same question about the topography of the distribution of glycinergic amarcarine cells. But yes, I, I was wondering if, if you have done any morphological study of the distribution of this. So was the, the question was in the same way as uh, Ichinose's question. So, but you already mm -hmm. uh, answered it. And um, so this is just by curiosity. Did you, you apply this, uh, this stimuli which generate the sensitization? Have you have you seen by chance any stimuli which generate the opposite effect, the depression, in mm -hmm. terms of the sensitization mm -hmm. over your studies, or if have you detected the opposite uh, effect mm -hmm. in any population of direction selectivity R uh, RGCs, mm -hmm. or not really? Oh yes, that's a great question. So we whether question is whether we can induce adaptation yes, right, instead exactly. of sensitization with um, any other stimuli. Let's yeah. say play with the size or you know duration of the preceding stimuli. Mm -hmm. well. uh, so we haven't uh, we haven't using so you know if we show this very brief period of like uh, gradings or moving motion stimulus, we always see sensitization. Uh, but, but, but I think the, the contextual modulation of, the, of those on of ds ganglion cells is, uh, is definitely, uh, there's a more rich phenomenon behind it. So for example, previously, Mikhail Rifflin's group have shown that if you show a slightly, a, 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 quite a different type of induction stimulus, uh, she can 
she can flip the tuning curve to the opposite direction. So, you, you know, the tuning can be flipped to the no direction. And that involves a, a different form of adaptation in the inner circuitry. Uh, in the in the retinal circuitry, so there are definitely I think there are definitely different contextual effects depending on the stimulus uh, that that we show. Um, but in 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 terms of our induction protocol, it's it's the sensitization is robust, and uh, it doesn't happen in all other in other ganglions in many other ganglion cell types. For the four type of alpha cells we tested, the other three doesn't show any uh, change in this protocol, but the sustained alpha alpha shows the sensitization. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, thanks for, for your answer. We have uh, more questions from Leon. So he's asking uh, on the mechanism of sustained response after induction. Mm -hmm. Is this simply due to reduce inhibition of off bipolar cell synapse? This could imply that baseline activity that the before the induction is set by by high levels of inhibition. Yeah. So so the question is before induction because we don't see sustained spiking. We also don't see sustained um, uh, EPA sustained. Uh, glutamatergic inputs. So when we record the baseline activity of the ganglion cells is very quiet. So the, the, the spontaneous firing rate in, in our prep is very low. We barely see spontaneous spiking before we show, show the visual stimulus. So I, I think that at the baseline level, maybe the excitation is already, the tonic excitation is very, is low in, at the level that low enough to to minimize a spontaneous spiking. And then after induction, the bipolar cell uh, release more glutamate. So there's more glutamatergic EPSCs, but actually uh, I didn't show it in the slides, but we also show that we also see an increased tonic IPSCs. So the, so the inhibitory uh, uh, input to the ganglion cell through amacrine cells is also enhanced, but overall, that increased inhibition is not sufficient to counteract the increased depolarization from the excitation. So we see this sustained uh, spiking, depolarization and spiking after induction. And uh, we think that because, of, it's the, because it's the sensitization of the bipolar cell excitation, whatever the amacrine cell target of those bipolar cells are also receiving more excitation. That's why those cells will also release more uh, IP, uh, GABA onto the ganglion cell. So there's a concomitant enhancement of EPSC and IPSC after induction. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you so much. So, yeah, so, um, so I would like to say again, thanks for accepting our invitation to the Sussex Vision Series. And now, uh, if you're interested, uh, if the audience is interested, they can join the, the private Zoom room uh, in which we will be discussing more in detail uh, all the results uh, you have shown now. So thanks again. And uh, we will keep the, the, the link online for a few minutes so we can keep uh, talking about uh, your research and future directions if you want. Okay, thank you so much, Jose. Okay, no Thanks. problem. Thanks a lot, everyone. All right. So people is start to join, started to join. So Anna Blasit just joined the conversation. So, yeah, I, well, when-, when Are we, we were... offline from the YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, yeah, I will. I will end uh -huh. the stream now. So the the link is already posted. So yeah, I will start. I will end the stream right now. Hey Anna, how are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs>